what I'm going to talk to you all about is uh, dengue during the COVID pandemic. So wh why I chose this subject was uh, we had we uh, had lot of problems in handling uh, dengue cases amidst the COVID uh, cases that were uh, coming at, la uh, at large volumes to the Ridge Ridgeway. At the moment, uh, there are less cases of COVID-19, but still the threat is there. So we don't know the exact situation of uh, COVID in the country at the moment because we are having other problems to deal with. At the same time, worldwide, there are some countries still having epi uh, epidemics of COVID as well. So dengue during the pandemic. Uh, dengue during the pandemic cases uh, increased in many countries during the pan pandemic. So this was uh, seen mainly in the tropics. So tropics, uh, mainly the countries like uh, South Asia, uh, then South America, and, and the countries close to the tropic, tropical belt uh, was affected by dengue as well. So there was a double burden of dengue with COVID. When COVID hit, hit the world around 2019, latter part of 2019, and we saw cases in 2020. Uh, so Brazil saw 19% of uh, increase in cases of dengue. And Thailand reported increased number of cases as well. And Ecuador reported one of the largest dengue outbreaks uh, it has seen uh, recently. What is the Sri Lankan situation? So this, I, I quoted uh, one of the uh, very good studies uh, done by uh, some of our own epidemiologists, Dr. Prasad Dianagi, Dr. Asit Tisera, and also Joachim Rocklau, uh, uh, who had analyzed impact of COVID-19 uh, lockdown on dengue transmission in Sri Lanka. So what you can see is, uh, is what they have found in their epidemiological study was so little little bit about dengue in Sri Lanka. So dengue in Sri Lanka was there for a long time, for decades. But the pattern started changing more towards in the 90s. 90s, uh, we saw uh, it becoming more endemic and having epidemics as well. Then up to about 2008-2009, uh, the, there were epidemics, but we saw the worst epidemic of dengue around 2009. There, there were so many deaths as well. And uh, then uh, towards uh, 2017, we saw the worst epidemic of dengue hitting this country. So that was the situation when, when the pandemic uh, of uh, COVID came uh, was affecting the other world countries. Uh, so uh, basically what you can see is the pattern of dengue in this country was such and we were getting after 2009 we were seeing epidemics during the time of the two monsoons. The wet zone got the monsoons around uh, the southwest uh, monsoons around uh, May to September, where we saw a large number of cases. And uh, then the eastern part had the, the, the northeast monsoon that was around uh, from November to January. Again, the, the eastern part saw more cases at that time. So, uh, but what you can see here is a, what they have analyzed is a five year average and a, Five year, within the last five years, what is the average amount or number of cases during these two periods, monsoonal periods? So, so what it's seen is uh, the first uh, quarter, that is the uh, southwest monsoon, you can see, uh, sorry, the first quarter is your north, north uh, northeast monsoon. You can see the eastern part of the country being affected. Then uh, more towards uh, uh, the uh, sep May to September, you, that is the second part is your due to your uh, southwest monsoon. But in 20, 2020, you can see 2020 is clear difference. 
in the first quarter where where the eastern part of the country is affected there had been comparative to the last five years there had been more cases and towards 2020 quarter hardly any cases that is the time we are getting the highest number of epidemics in the country so that's the 2020 quarter so what are these epidemiological points uh, uh, pointing to so some of the inferences that was derived by this excellent study was the main reason being mobility restriction so during the dengue pandemic uh, that is 2020 from uh, uh, around uh, uh, 2020 around march we had lockdowns so there was significant mobility restriction and the main impact were interestingly was children not to 19 so this is the age group that was mainly uh, seen uh, as having a larger number of uh, less number of uh, cases so due to mobility restriction so that is reflected by school closure from 12th march until 6th july so the very long period of school being closed uh, but interestingly countries like singapore opposite impact there had been 37.2 percent increase also i showed you that most of the tropical countries saw an increase in number of cases so what is the difference in our country so the some of the uh, inferences derived from uh, the, the study was mainly the mobility restriction and also maybe that uh, children are bitten at uh, school rather than at home because they, during the closure there was a lot of uh, uh, cleaning and community activity going on and they cleaned the households of uh, breeding sites and there was the, the in addition the, the phis and the army was involved in more in covid control so the households were cleaned actually during this uh, closure so that may be one reason and this interesting fact that it, the children are probably bitten more at uh, school rather than at home so what happened now that was 2020 so here I, we have few figures uh, to uh, compare in LRH 2020 and 21 so the, we compared November December months of 2020 versus 2021 so you can see a tenfold increase in dengue cases in 2021 because the, the school opened and there were less number of uh, COVID cases and until today the number of dengue cases are rising up. It's a bit worrying. Now we are heading towards the the, uh, the monsoonal rains, uh, the monsoonal rains of uh, and we'll see much more cases coming up due to dengue. So what is dengue fever? So the, I don't have to go into detail about dengue fever because everybody knows of all the facts and we have four serotypes basically and the worst serotype being type four sorry type two and it's responsible for most of the epidemics but what we are having these days is more type uh, three which is not as worse as type two but you can get complications due to in type three as well but we are seeing a mixed pattern as well the, the serotypes so what about dengue dengue classification all of you all know that it is in 2009 this uh, the classifications of dengue had uh, changed dengue with or without warning signs or severe dengue severe dengue is severe plasma leakage severe hemorrhage severe organ impairment then 2011 WHO defined the expanded dengue syndrome. What is expanded dengue syndrome? So the expanded dengue syndrome is uh, involvement of organs, single or multiple, without evidence of any plasma leakage. So that is very significant because now you can see, I mean, towards end of epidemics, especially when serotype 2 is circulating, you can see more number of cases due to expanded dengue syndrome and interestingly if there are co-infections co-infections with other viruses like corona you can have expanded dengue syndrome so the expanded dengue syndrome is 
a common way uh, expanded dengue syndrome with present with hepatic he failure with encephalopathy encephalitis and uh, any organ can be involved kidney and sometimes rarely hematological complications like hlh so these type of cases could be classified as expanded dengue syndrome and and if you are not very alert about these uh, sometimes child or the patient can have complications so we had a lot of problems with dengue versus covid in diagnosing because both conditions are viral illnesses having similar symptoms like fever myalgia skin rashes fatigue with thrombocytopenia lymphopenia and having raised liver infection as well common to both of them so dengue symptoms the classical symptoms retro orbital pain or uh, the headaches of dengue and all these symptoms can be seen in covid as well so we saw uh, children with omicron having lot of headaches almost like the retro orbital type of headaches so going into the phases of dengue everybody knows about the phases febrile phase critical phase recovery phase after incubation of 4 to 10 days so each of these phases of dengue we had problems in differentiating dengue was a severe covid illnesses so febrile phase of dengue so febrile phase of dengue is described as very high fever uh, usually high grade fever with headaches and sometimes uh, the fever pattern in dengue could be of saddle back described as saddle back sometimes you see that few days of fever fever coming down then uh, coming up again uh, then th these type of uh, uh, presentations you can miss some of the cases and they go into leaking so you send the patient home but then then the next peak of fever comes and they may leak but this is more seen in dengue rather than covid you don't see a sort of saddle back pattern so the confusion was seen due to false positive serology false positive dengue igm in patients with covid so uh, patients having covid was seen to have a uh, false positive igm uh, for dengue so first reported in singapore in march 2020 in dengue endemic areas this led to diagnostic and public health concerns fever with positive dengue serology better to screen for covid as well so then came 2021 this unusual complication of uh, covid miss c or multi system inflammatory syndrome of children so actually this was seen du during 2020 around the world but we started seeing uh, more cases in 2021 and this is a small analysis of number of cases seen at lrh from july 1st of july to 21st september 2021 where you can see the most of the cases are of in children uh, over 6 years of age and there had been analysis of 85 children and towards the end of 2021 we saw double the, that number in lrh and the management setting of missy was mainly in icu but you can see nearly uh, so large number of cases cases were managed in the ward as well the yellow is in the icu the other, the greenish color is in the wards so towards the latter part of the uh, missy epidemic we started managing more cases in the wards and in fact we managed cases who were on one anotrope as well so that led to less overcrowding in the icus so you can see some of the classical rashes seen in dengue in this picture so what you see here the back of a child having the macular papular rash which is seen rather commonly but the lower picture is showing a purpuric and ecchymotic rash which is a very uncommon presentation of dengue although people think it's a hemorrhagic fever you don't see the purpuric rash commonly unless the child is 
in a in a real estate or or sometimes with df you can see but echematic patches if you see think of whether this immune thrombocytopenia sometimes i mean it could be a viral induced immune thrombocytopenia you see more echematic patches rather than it being a dengue uh, fever so some of the skin and mucoglutin involvement in miss is seen in this slide so you can see some of the pic in, in here you can see uh, the red lips and also the eyelids being red and the typical macular papular rash which can be mistaken for dengue as well so in this child the child is very irritable having red eyes the red mouth the eyelids are red and of course they some of them showed the kawasaki type of coated tongue strawberry tongue what was different about the redness of the eye seen in dengue versus missy was uh, dengue children had injected eyes but the, in 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 uh, coit type of uh, missy because like, like kawasaki eye signs where the limbus was spared as in this child with missy so here is the typical islands of white in a sea of red the recovery rash of dengue which is uh, commonly seen and when you see this at the early part of the infection is more erythema you don't see the islands but what you can see here is a something similar this is a child with miss c with the with a toxic shock like presentation right so I'll just illustrate some of the cases we saw during the, the a seven-year-old child presenting to LRH with a five-day history of high fever. On examination, the child had generalized macular papular rash. His eyes were found to be red. Full blood count 4,300, neutral 52, lymphocyte 41, 83,000 platelets with a CRP of 240. When we did our sound scan, there was a thin rim of fluid in the hypotrenal pouch and dengue antigen was negative. So here was a common presentation we had and a dilemma whether this was dengue. So, but there are a few features that may not fit to dengue like 240 of CRP and a child having redness of mouth and uh, eyes. But again, as I mentioned, even in dengue, usually you can have red mouth and eyes as well. So what was striking was this CRP. So in this child, Sometimes it may lead to confusion. This child had Miss C. When we did the IgG level, it was over 10. So that, uh, that is very suggestive of uh, Miss C rather than dengue. So this was the case definition of uh, Miss C we adapted from CDC and WHO. And uh, this, this is the college uh, definition. And uh, child having less than 21 years of age with more than three days of fever. Uh, having evidence of two or more uh, organs being involved. So skin, mucous, skin, membranes, cardiac, gentle, respiratory, hematological, renal, neurology, all the, the, these type of complications we saw in Missy children. But what was common was a child coming, ha having uh, three, fever of three or more days duration like with a, like a Kawasaki-like percentage. All, some may look almost like leptospirosis as well because at the, during the 2020, epidemic uh, of missy we saw a lot of leptospirosis as well uh, cases of leptospirosis as well so it was quite similar and and these children most of the children had gastrointestinal like diarrhea severe abdominal pains with cardiac in coronary involvements some of them had respiratory involvements like a pneumonia as well interstitial type of pneumonia and renal hematological manifestations were rare and hardly I didn't see a single case of renal involvement or hepatic encephalopathies we didn't see with Miss C. So with those features, more than three days of fever and two or more organs being in, involved, and if we can show evidence of inflammation and excluding other common causes like leptospirosis and common viral illnesses, having an, a positive current or recent sars cov COVID-2 infection judged by RT-PCR, RAT-2 antibodies. Out of these, RT-PCR and RAT-2 are negative in most of the cases. 
and the antibodies were very useful in diagnosing them because the IgG levels were over 10, some very much higher than 10, around 35, 45. So that was, they were missy cases. Uh, or confirmed exposure to confirmed uh, case within the last four weeks. So this, this was the diagnostic workup we made up in the college based on some of the very excellent guidelines, especially the Indian Academy of Pediatrics, we adapted this, where tier one and tier two workup was done in most of the MEC cases. So suspected cases, we did a count, LAST, albumin, uh, creatinine, electrolyte, CRP, ESR, and sent for uh, COVID testing, including the serology. And we did a DD workup of blood culture, blood culture, and we, mind you, did the NS1 antigen in most of the cases. We didn't do a dengue serology uh, very frequently because of this IgM uh, cross-reactive issue. And in suspected cases, we checked for leptospirosis and other illnesses as well. Uh, and ultrasound scan was sometimes useful. But as, as I illustrated the previous case, tweet in the hepatorenal pouch was seen in missy cases as well. So that's due to serocytes. Some of them had serocytes amounting to almost like appendicitis needing. Some of them got the appendix out and then was to see that they had uh, missy. So then if there was any suspicion, we went into our tier two workup of especially the cardiac ECG, top Y, echo so if to look for a coronary aneurysms and NT pro BNP, we didn't have the facility. We didn't do it routinely. Other countries, they had done that as well. And blood gas, clotting studies, especially the D-dimers were very useful. In MISC, it was very high. Fibrinogen, all these inflammatory markers were very high in, uh, in MISC. LDH, ferritin, triglycerides. All the, the of them are uh, acute phase reaction. Those were high. But having said all that, we never forgot about the Fowden tests, the HESS tests. It actually helped us in differentiating some of these missy cases from dengue. Of course, it was positive mainly in the dengue cases, but not 100% of dengue will have a positive tonical test. Some studies show it's around 50%. Okay, then the febrile phase with warning signs. All of you know of the warning signs, severe abdominal pains, persistent vomiting, change in sensorium, mucosal bleeding, hepatomegaly, thrombocytopenia with increased hematocrit. So, of these, most of these MISC cases, they had severe abdominal pains with persistent vomiting. And very rarely only they had hepatomegaly. And most of them had thrombocytopenia as well. But concurrent increase in hematocrit was specially seen in uh, leaking dengue. So the critical phase also face we face some uh, dilemmas in diagnosis like the critical phase the fever pattern so in dengue this described as when you enter the critical phase the defervescence is seen by a drop in temperature it, but what is uh, wrongly understood is the fever doesn't come to the baseline it comes from somewhere around 40 41 centigrade to around 37.5 to 38 centigrade and it doesn't touch the base, baseline. And some cases before defervescence, uh, leaking starts. So, so uh, defervescence was not a very useful tool to differentiate. Again, when they are in shock, dengue shock was a mystery shock was a dilemma as well in the ETU and especially in our wards as well. Missy shock. Missy shock is mainly a cardiogenic and a vasoplegic shock, but we see they, they come with vomiting, so they will have cold peripheries as well. Although it's described more of a warm shock, most of them are vomiting, they were in cold shock as well. So features of cardiogenic shock was more towards we see like a third heart sound, pulmonary edema, signs like uh, basal crepitations, hepatomegaly was more uh, in, uh, suggestive of a missy type of presentation going to shock. Narrow pulse more towards dengue. But what we found, especially in the in the acute situation where we had a little bit of uh, 
the uh, 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 timing window between doing an echo, we had to quickly decide. So the focus was useful. Full. Point of care ultrasound scan. So what you can see here is point of care ultrasound scan showing uh, the IVC filling. So IVC filling severely affected in uh, a sh dengue shock rather than in a missy shock. So when they came in severe shock due to vomiting, some of them were again very difficult to differentiate, but it was useful point of care ultrasound. Again, to illustrate another case uh, we saw during this epidemic, a seven-year-old girl transferred from LRH from Caravanella in July 2021, presented to Caravanella in shock, and the dengue antigen had been positive, was treated according to national guidelines for dengue shock syndrome. Even after recovering from shock and end of leaking, patient found to be ill with high continuous spikes of fever. So, dengue antigen positive uh, was in shock, treated, but still high fever was going on. So, the child was transferred to Lady Ridge Hospital, having continuous few high fever spikes, no improvement in platelets. Ferritin was 2600, B-dimer was shown to be 6200, very high. And echo showed coronary involvement. So, this was a case of uh, dengue. Have, and having missy, a dual infection. And this child showed the IgG, IgG of over 40. So, dengue and COVID 19 co infections uh, can occur. So, co infections associated with more, more uh, severity if, if both viruses come together. Associated with more complications like septic shock, ARDS, and MODS. So that is uh, usually seen in uh, uh, adult type of COVID illnesses. The ARDS and MODS is seen in the severe uh, uh, forms of COVID in adults. But we saw some of them in comorbid children, ARDS, MODS. But if that type of picture can occur in co-infections as well. Then if Missy comes with dengue, the dengue part can have severe complications, like severe disease, like severe shock and profound shock. And the, there can be expanded dengue syndromes in co-infections co and a high risk of death if both viruses are present. So devia, the severe dengue with Missy, a co-infection case series was published in November 2021, a study done in Bangladesh, who was facing a double burden of severe dengue and COVID at that time. All children presented with shock and plasma leakage, uh, having co-infections, mucoglutinous and gastrointestinal tract involvement was common in these children. And all children had shown echo showing coronary involvement and this is an example of co-infection causing severe disease. So this was similar to our Caravanella case. In fact, we saw few more similar such cases. So let me illustrate another case. Uh, we offer an example of COVID and dengue double burden showing complications. A 12-year-old boy with a past history of uncomplicated COVID-19 infection six weeks back presented on 10th April 2022 with a history of high-grade fever, 103, and vomiting of three days. Dengue NS1 antigen was positive in this child in day two of illness. On examination, he was hemodynamically stable. Child was monitored with dengue febrile phase chart, daily food blood count, and bedside ultrasound scans for leaking. High fever was persisting for five days with an ill look. Examination, the child had hepatosplenomegaly. So, hepatomegaly, we see in dengue, splenomegaly, not that common in dengue, although you can see it rarely. Uh, if you feel the spleen, think of other di di diagnoses as well. But here is a child, antigen positive. Then when we do did the blood test, it shows the uh, progression of uh, or WBC uh, slowly dropping, neutrophils 
dropping up to 800 from 2300 and platelets also dropping so bicytopenia and even hemoglobin is not that affected but there is a bicytopenia with uh, ST ALT going up in this child fibrinogen when we did it was not elevated but in the upper range LDH was slowly going up and what is striking is serum ferritin was uh, on the fourth day of fever it was 6531 and uh, the fifth day of fever it was 25418 very very high so again what you can see the wbc on the fifth and sixth day and you can see uh, the progression of reports and this child had dengue antigen IgM antibody we did as positive, Dengu IgG antibody also was positive. So we did it just as a routine and serology was done but we couldn't get the result. Uh, so blood culture negative, urine, uh, chest x-ray, few inflammatory changes and, uh, and other things were unremarkable but yeah, INR was quite high, it was 16.2. APTT was high as well uh, and the COVID uh, rat was negative, antibodies was reactive for COVID at, at a lower state. So what is the inference? So here is a child with dengue, in the, so, uh, dengue, having dengue, having fever going, high fever going on with a history of COVID in the past, so having HLH. So HLH score came to, H score came to nearly 96 to 98 percent possibility of HLH and this child was given methylprednisolone. So what you can see here is the arrow shows methylprednisolone and we were rapidly settling. But here is a situation, a dilemma situation again. Now here is a child who is ill, whose platelets are dropping. We can't do uh, bone marrows at that time and, and the hematology refused to do a blue bone marrow at this time. So we have to take a rapid decision to give steroids or not and so uh, the HLS score was useful uh, its score so during the ward stay he was directed to have pericholecystic fluid and fluid in the hepatorenal pouch so after giving methylprednisolone and the fever came down the child started slowly leaking managed just dhf with critical phase monitoring and with appropriate uh, fluid management critical phase was managed with uh, maintenance of five five percent without needing any fluid boluses or blood. So what we thought was, now this is a child with a history of COVID, co-infection with uh, dengue, having HLH, treated early with steroids. Because of that, the child didn't have significant leaking. And I, I have gone through a lot of series abroad where these, these such cases when steroid was not given at that time, these children had gone to very severe leaking, severe dengue with hemorrhages ending up in ICU, some of them succumbing. So basically, uh, I hope that we won't get any more further cases or epidemics of COVID in the future. Uh, but if we get, we should be ready for these type of complications because number of cases of dengue is going up and the epidemiologies are slowly changing. So secondary HLH, I won't go into detail. This is the uh, HLH uh, criteria. So four out of uh, uh, that should be uh, met and HLH H score. So hyperferritinemia is associated with secondary HLH and dengue and severe COVID infections as well. So a caution. But you don't get very high ferritins as in HLH in even in severe COVID. Severe COVID, you can get up to say up to about 10,000 uh, in adults they have described, but I don't think you can get it around 25,000. So severe COVID infections. So HLH diagnosis, uh, uh, five out of uh, eight HLH criteria using the uh, 2004 criteria and the H score probability, we found it very useful because we sometimes couldn't do bone marrows at that stage, uh, its criteria was useful to us. And here was another child who we could do a bone marrow showing this is a child who had an abscess, lung abscess, 
who in the ward had dengue went into HLA. But we, this child didn't have COVID as well. So this is a child showing a bone marrow suggestive of HLH, uh, showing hematophagocytosis. So dengue HLH is more commonly seen in severe dengue associated with serotype 2. So concurrent COVID-19 and dengue with HLH, uh, there, there are so many case reports and case studies uh, appearing, but no formal studies done. So uh, for the future, if we are having co-infections, we have to be very careful. So this was a co-infection series. I was involved in, in 2018, uh, where there was a co-infection. There was an epidemic of uh, 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 viral influenza going on in, in the south, in Karapitiya, where some of these children had, in, in addition to influenza A, uh, they had adenovirus involvement as well. So most of them went into uh, HLH as well. So th this uh, series uh, we presented. So summary is, dengue incident is on the rise during the, it was rising during the epidemic, the, uh, the pandemic of COVID. It was rising in most of the countries. Then, but we saw a significant reduction in 20, 2020 due to research I told you but slowly it's going up now 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 the numbers are going up uh, the dengue cases are going up according to the epidemiologist we had a discussion it's going up and more severe dengue disease types are recognized it may be a result of co-infections so future let's hope it won't happen if the, both the viruses are endemic we will see more cases like this and we should be aware about co-infections and, and the fact that the dengue cases are going up and we have to again get ready for epidemics of dengue during uh, uh, seasons coming up. Thank you very much.